you've just dropped the average cost of a house in Las Vegas to buy into a high profile televised poker tournament among some of the best players in the world, and this crazy Aussie on your left just 10x your turn bet and 3x pot shoved the river. What do you do? Well, first off, it would probably be important to know what type of maniac you're dealing with before making this critical decision for your tournament life. And to get some insight into Adamo's general style of play, we're going to fast forward to a few other hands played by Michael in this very same tournament. In this first hand, Jay Schindler opens the action in the low jack with queens, and Michael raises it up over 6x in the big blind with 8-7 of hearts. Now, although this hand obviously isn't the strongest combo in his range, with the players being very deep, it's certainly the type of hand that the solver will incorporate into its three betting range, both for board coverage and also because it's capable of making very strong disguised hands. The flop comes king 7 5 with one heart, giving Michael second pair, and he c bets around third pot, which according to the solver is basically mandatory. Jake calls, the turn is the 6 of hearts, and it goes check check. Although this card gives Michael the additional equity of both a straight and flush draw, we see that in his shoes, the solver is mostly preserving this equity through checking. This turn card definitely favors the in position caller's range, which should be pocket pair and suited connector heavy, so both Michael and the solver decide to check here. The river is the king of diamonds, Michael checks again, apparently in an attempt to get to showdown, perhaps against an ace high type of hand, but Jake has other ideas, as the paired king likely makes his queens good, and so he decides to put in around a half pot bet. Facing this bet, Michael proceeds to burn off a number of time banks going into a very long tank. To most, it probably appeared as though Adamo was deliberating between a hero call and a fold, but in reality, he was conjuring up something much more sinister as he decides to rip his second pair with a 4x over bet raise. So what in the world is Michael thinking here? Well, obviously we can't read Michael's mind, but my guess is that when thinking about strategies, Adamo considers how his range as a whole wants to play. Probably not combo by combo, but rather in terms of thinking of at least a few hands in his range that would generally like to raise, call, or fold. And if he finds any value raises in his range, it means that he must have bluffs as well. So that raises the question of whether he has value that would want to shove here. Well, recall that the turn card favored the preflop caller, so the solver was doing a lot of checking in Michael's shoes, including with a majority of its sets and two pairs, some of which transformed into full houses on the river. And some of these full houses, particularly pocket sevens, checked again on the river to give the in-position player the opportunity to bet for value or as a bluff. So now that we've determined that Michael should have some value raises here, what about his bluffs? Well, in GTO land, bluffs are often derived from hands that block the strongest combos available given the board. And if we isolate Adamo's weakest hands, and then filter for combos that are shoving a majority of the time, this narrows down to two combos. A7, which blocks the full house, and pocket eights, which block the straight. So although the solver prefers bluff catching with Michael's particular combo, his hand actually does have decent blocking properties to both the full house and straight. And when we consider this hand from an EV perspective, it may give us some insights into Michael's possible thought process here. First off, we know that facing this bet from Jake, Michael loses to most if not all of Jake's value. Basically, the cutoff point for betting for value instead of closing the action in position is Jack's plus. As a result, the equity of Michael's hand shrinks down around 10% after Jake decided to bet, meaning it now is less likely to win at showdown. Of course, 8-7 does still retain some equity, because Jake should have some bluffs in his range, but if Michael raises here, he beats those bluffs anyways. So from an EV perspective against bluffs, calling and raising with 8-7 is a wash. But what about versus Jake's value? Well, obviously, if Jake calls Michael's raise, Adamo will end up losing many more chips than he would have if he simply decided to call, which is a negative factor. But on the other hand, if Michael raises, some of Jake's value betting combos will need to fold, which is a positive factor. In fact, around half of Jake's value combos should fold to this bet at the equilibrium, which adds to the EV of bluff raising. 
So on balance, although bluffs are difficult to find here, 8 7 suited, all things considered, logically appears to be one of the better bluffing candidates, and the EV regret for shoving is actually relatively low. And facing this decision for his tournament life, Jake decides to live on to fight another day. Although the solver does bluff catch queens some of the time, it would seem that most human players would also fold in this spot. After all, the conventional wisdom these days seems to be that when villain makes a massive river over bet shove, he always has it. But of course, if that's the conventional wisdom, then it means that taking a contrarian posture, as Michael did here with his unique bluff, could print money in the long run. In this next hand, Adamo opens the action in the hijack with 5-3 of clubs, and Bonomo calls in the big blind with ace-3 off. The flop is jack 9 ace with two spades and a club, and Adamo goes bombs away with a 125% pot overbet with nothing but a couple back doors. This is definitely a board where he has the nut advantage, given that Bonomo shouldn't have many or any aces or jacks, and he should have a very wide range with the ante in play, so this larger bet is the one that is used most often by the solver. Bonomo calls with his top pair and the turn is the 7 of clubs and Michael bombs it again with a 150% pot bet. This time, although the solver isn't firing much with bare flushes that don't have a pair, with the players being very deep stacked, it does use this sizing quite often at around 15% of the time, and the EV regret for betting this sizing with this particular combo is relatively low. Given the huge flop and turn bets, Bonomo's top pair transforms into a mere bluff catcher, and he decides to muck. And we see that although ace-3 off is not in our particular range, the solver does fold ace-4 and ace-5 off in full. In this final hand, Michael opens it up in the low jack with jack-9 of diamonds, Nick Petrangelo defends in the big blind with 7-5 off, and the flop comes 6-deuce-3 with 1 diamond. Now given the fact that Michael had been playing quite aggressively up to this point, you might think that to achieve some balance, this type of low board might be the ideal one for Michael to pump his brakes, but no, that is not the case. He bombs it again, betting around 130% of the pot. Not too surprisingly, the solver isn't using this overbet very often. Although the low jack definitely has the range advantage given the big blind's wide range, the big blind actually has the highest proportion of the nuttiest hands on this board with more straights and two pairs. But again, although this play isn't frequently used by the solver, the EV regrets for all betting options with this hand, with the backdoor flush draw, are relatively low, as the big blind has plenty of trash that will need the fold facing a bet. With his gut shot to the nuts, Nick calls, which we see is the standard play, although the solver does mix in some raises here as well. The turn is the queen of clubs, and you might think that now, finally, this is the spot where Michael will ease off the pedal and give up, since he has no draw and he only has two undercards. After all, Nick just called Adamo's huge flop bet, and he certainly could have all kinds of strong hands in his range that are perfectly willing to stack off against a very aggressive player. But Michael Adamo is not afraid of any monsters under the bed, and he fires off another barrel with a two-thirds pot bet. And we see that the solver does bet this sizing with Jack-9 of diamonds at some frequency. This card definitely favors the preflop aggressor's range, which results in a relatively high frequency of betting overall, and at the same time, the low jack doesn't have many natural bluffs in its range to continue with. We see that unpaired draws make up less than 6% of Michael's overall range, and so it appears that the solver simply randomly mixes in some bluffs with all of its weakest unmade hands, as we see that the EV regret for bluffing all of these combos with this sizing is relatively low. As we mentioned at the beginning of this video, if the solver is betting for value in a particular spot, it will always pair that value with bluffs. And if there are few quote unquote natural bluffs available, it will nevertheless pull them out from somewhere, which now brings us full circle to our original hand. To recap this scenario, it was the first level of a 300k buy-in tournament. Daniel opened on the button with ace king and Adamo called in the big blind. The flop went check check. Daniel bet around half pot with his top pair on the turn, and Adamo proceeded to check raise this bet 10x. The river was the 5 of hearts, pairing the board, and Adamo shoved around 3x pot. So before even getting his first cup of green tea, 
Daniel is being asked to risk it all with a measly top pair. What should he do? Well, Daniel ultimately decides to swallow hard, putting in the call, but this time, unfortunately for him, Michael has the goods, tabling 8-6 for the flop straight. Now, some of you armchair quarterbacks out there are likely scoffing at this call, declaring it to be a massive punt. But given what we now know about Michael, is it really? Based on the hands we just reviewed, which were all within the first two levels of this tournament, it's quite clear that Michael has absolutely no problem with bluffing off his entire stack. And against a player like this, you simply must be willing to bluff catch. Every time you enter into the pot with Michael Adamo, you must be prepared to play for stacks because he is, and if you aren't, then this type of animal is just going to run over the entire table and you along with it. And given Michael's extremely polarizing line, we know that top pair is likely going to be at a minimum a bluff catching candidate as it will beat most if not all of Adamo's bluffs. And we see that hands as weak as pocket tens are in fact calling here. Although Ace King Off specifically is mostly folding, the EV regret for calling is relatively low. And if we assume that Michael tends to veer towards over aggression, which is probably not a bad assumption to make, given that it seems that whenever he faces a mixed decision, Michael most often chooses the path of violence, then not only should you bluff catch some of the time, you should probably be calling with most of your bluff catchers that do not have poor card removal qualities. Now some of you may be asking yourself at this point, how Adamo seems to always know that his bluff or value bet will work? Well, the reality is, he doesn't. We can't peer into Michael's mind, but I'm quite certain that he's fully aware of the fact that there is a not insignificant chance that his bluffs may be called and that his value bets may be folded against. But it's pretty obvious that this probability is not enough to deter him. Rather, it appears that Adamo is wholly unaffected by the types of fears and insecurities that encumber most men, whether it be the bright lights, the money, or the risk of embarrassment. He simply makes calculated decisions based on what he believes will win him the most in the long run, and then he just lets the chips fall as they may. You've been